This is a video lesson for First Language English ITCSE, in which we're going to take a close look at the six different text types that you could be asked to write in your exams. We'll also have a look at exemplars of each of these different texts, so you can get an idea of the kind of thing that you might be asked to write. You can download all of the resources for this video lesson, including this PowerPoint, a worksheet, and even take a review quiz over on totally.co.uk, which is linked below in this video description. Do head over there if you want to find more content for your exams. If you're a teacher or a student, there's something over there for you. Beginning now with an overview of question three. So the question three is also known as the extended response. It's the third question on your reading paper one. So for this question, you will be given a text to read. It's usually some form of story and you will have to turn it into one of these text types, a letter, a newspaper report, a journal, a speech, an interview, or a magazine article. Generally, you should write about two to four pages for this question, depending on the size of your handwriting. Now, if you're also doing the exam, so you're not doing coursework, on your paper two, the writing exam, you could also be asked to write a speech, an interview, or a magazine article. So you can see that these six specific text types are very, very important to us, especially if you're doing exam route because you've got two different opportunities where they could come up. Some general writing advice for you. So whenever you approach an exam and you're asked to write something, you should always think about the VARP. And I know that this isn't a very catchy acronym, but it's useful. So, here is what VARP stands for. Voice, audience, register, purpose, and format. What do you guess that these words might mean for Cambridge First Language English? Beginning with voice. So voice is essentially who are you writing as? Whose voice are you assuming are you taking on? So are you writing as a grandmother, as a student, as a concerned citizen, as a mother, as a father, as a teacher? Whose voice are you trying to copy? Audience then is who you are writing to. So you've got your voice, yourself, your audience, the person that you're directing your writing to. And that could be a literal audience, right? It could be like you're giving a speech to your local neighborhood, or it could be just one person. Like if you were writing a letter to your mother, the mother would be the audience. Next up is register, which is essentially how formal or informal your language should be. Like how casual should you be? How polite and respectful should you be? A quick hint then that for Cambridge, it always falls between formal and semi-formal. You'll never be asked to write something very informal because Cambridge, they already know that you can write using slang. You're teenagers, that's not a problem. So essentially it's, are you writing as though you're writing to your boss or your head teacher and you've got to be very polite and very, very formal? Or are you writing to your best friend? In which case you can be more casual. Um, I've seen students, for example, talk about anyways, da, 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 which would be too informal for any context in Cambridge. So do make sure that you're always grammatically accurate and not using slang. But yes, register is basically, are you writing formally or semi-formally for this exam? Purpose then is why are you writing? What is your purpose? Why? Why do this? Are you discussing, persuading, arguing, informing, entertaining, describing, narrating or analysing? Um, now, very often on Cambridge, it will be, for paper two, it will always be discuss, argue or persuade. Um, for paper one, more often might be to inform or to entertain, to tell about something that has happened often because you've, you've been given a text that you need to read, then you need to do something with it. So very often for paper one, more likely to inform or entertain. For paper two, it's always to discuss, persuade or argue. Finally is format, which is what text type have you been asked to write? What form have you been asked to write in? Have you been asked to write a letter, a magazine, a speech, an interview, a diary, so on and so forth? Um, and all of this comes together, your VORP comes together to help you decide what writing style will work best for the task that Cambridge has given you. For question three, I can't teach it and I will never teach it without emphasising this point here. When you write your question three, of course your structure is very important. This is how I recommend that you structure your question three for every single question apart from interview. So you should write a short introduction and a short conclusion. When I'm saying short, I mean literally one to three sentences, no more than that. And then you should have 
three paragraphs in the middle that should all be equal in length. That is very important because Cambridge want for your reading marks to see that you're covering each of those bullet points equally, right? So very, very important. Now, if you're writing an interview, you don't need to have an introduction or a conclusion um, and Cambridge will give you your questions and then you'll answer each of those questions equally. We'll get into it in more detail, but the main thing that I want you to take away is the three bullet points need to be addressed equally. I'm going to upload a video lesson for the reading aspect of question three, which will cover all of this in more detail. Forgive me for moving on quite swiftly, but the reason why I am is because this video lesson is already going to be super long and I just want to focus on writing. I can talk for another hour about the reading aspect of this question, but I'm sure that you don't want that right now. So let's move on. We are shortly going to have a look at the six text types that you could be asked to write. And what I wanted to do was to take one story and turn it into those six different text types so that you can see what the same story would look like given those different text types, right? So they're all based on this story to some degree. Here is the story. School teacher, Samantha Salmon, loves some alliteration, purposely set off the school fire alarm to avoid teaching her year 11 English class. This is not inspired by me, I promise. It's year 10 I want to avoid. <laughs> Joke, joking. <laughs> Miss Salmon had been struggling to control the behaviour in her class and was going to be observed that lesson. So she's trying to avoid being seen to be a bad teacher. The fire alarm caused chaos in the school and the fire brigade arrived only to realise it was a hoax. The head teacher initially wrongfully accused a year nine boy, Mark Jang, before Miss Salmon stepped forward to admit her guilt, then publicly resigned from her job. So this is the story that we are going to adapt into our six different text types. Let's take a look at newspaper reports. Here is our newspaper report prompt. Imagine you are a local journalist. Recent events have prompted you to write a newspaper report about the need to improve working conditions for teachers. Write the newspaper report. Question then, what is our VORP for this task? The voice. So firstly, the voice is we are a local journalist, right? So in the local area, knows a lot about what's going on, but we are a journalist. So we should be being quite unbiased, fair, unemotional. The audience, well, it doesn't clearly say, it doesn't say an audience, but we can assume it will be for a local audience who reads newspapers. And who reads newspapers? Probably older people more serious. Thinking about myself, I'm in my 30s. I don't think I've ever bought a newspaper. I would always just read it on my phone. So I do think that if you're reading the newspaper, you're more likely to be an older person. Sorry if that's a stereotype. <laughs> and therefore our register is going to be formal, unemotional, polite. And so the purpose will be to inform, inform about what happened. And the format is a newspaper report. And so newspaper reports tend to be unbiased. Well, they should be unbiased. In practice, everything's got bias. Um, unbiased, unemotional, um, and a little bit like distant. She's not going to have strong opinions about what happened necessarily. She's just going to report the facts. Before we take a look at the exemplar, I'm going to give you some general advice about newspaper articles beginning with newspaper headlines. So my advice for a newspaper headline is you should be brief, be neutral, avoid bias, and you don't need to use articles like the or a. So you don't need to say a teacher set fire to a school. You can say teacher set fire to school, for example, and just make it that little bit shorter. Um, and similarly, you can see teacher set fire to school is Neutral, it's not saying evil teacher set fire to innocent school, dot, 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 children murdered. It's, it's quite taking a step back. Some examples of newspaper headlines, space exploration mission reaches new frontier, climate change crisis sparks global call to action, and world leaders gather for historic peace summit. So you can see it's just factually, unemotionally telling you what happened. So essentially newspaper headlines, you don't need to be too creative. Just give the most obvious, boring title that comes to your mind, keep it short, move on. Here are some example newspaper articles of famous events in history. Beginning then with Elvis's death, 
we have got Elvis, King of Rock, dies at 42. Okay, you can argue King of Rock is a little bit biased. It's, it's you know, it's making him sound important, which I, he was. <laughs> um, but he's not being too emotional about it. It's not like Elvis tragically dies at 42 or something like that. It's very factual in terms of its tone. Over here in the middle one, um, when Obama got elected as president, Obama makes history. So yes, there's some opinion there, we know, because it's implied that that's good, which it was, in my opinion. Maybe I shouldn't give my opinion, never mind. Um, but it's, it's very short and brief. Obama makes history, three words there. US decisively elects first black president that Democrats expand control of Congress. So it's not saying the US decisively elects its first black president. See, it's removing those articles there to make it shorter. And then finally, if you're in the UK, you'll know about this one. During the pandemic, Marcus Rashford, who plays for Manchester United, essentially went to war with the government to get free school meals for poorer children. He was very cool. So some facts. So let's look at the title. Rashford forces PM into U-turn on free meals. So it's not Rashford forces the Prime Minister into a U-turn on free meals at schools. It's been very, very condensed. And there's a little bit of bias here, I suppose, in terms of forces, because it's showing Rashford as a powerful and persuasive and important figure who's managed to undermine the government in some way. But other than that, the language is quite factual. So this is the kind of tone that you're aiming for. Sounding unbiased, but everything's got bias. So newspaper reports, the tone, it should be formal, unemotional and factual. Your introduction paragraph, your first paragraph should be a 5W paragraph. I'm going to show you an example of that in a second, which is a paragraph that states who, what, where, when and why about the event. You can quote witnesses if you want to, but make sure you keep it short and relevant to the question. And any quotes that you include should be made up by you. So never, ever, ever copy from the text, ever for Cambridge. They don't like that. You will get a lower mark if you do that. For newspaper writing, avoid using first person I. They don't say I. You should use passive voice instead. Like, it is believed that. Many claim to have seen that rather than saying, I believe that, I saw that, so avoid the I. And if you're in the UK, essentially the tone that you're going for is more like a broadsheet newspaper rather than a tabloid newspaper, if that's useful to you. Here is the 5W paragraph as an example. So this would be enough for an introduction. Remember I said your introduction only needs to be one to three sentences long. Yesterday, a local high school teacher, Jared Rigsby, 32, was found dead on school grounds. Local police have confirmed that the cause of his death is now believed to be murder. So when? Yesterday. Who? Jared Rigsby. What happened? He was found dead. Where? On the school grounds. And why? Because he was murdered. So that's what I mean when I say a 5W paragraph for your newspaper introduction. You might have already noticed in some of my examples, but um, when you give someone's name, it can sound quite nice to put their age in brackets. It's, it's a very common thing for newspapers to do. Um, if it doesn't say in the text what age a character is, you can make it up, but be sensible. Don't be like, Johnny Davis, 115, because that just makes the examiner like, be quiet, child. <laughs> and some examples here. Um, local teenager Daniel Wang, 16, stated, I saw the whole thing myself. The bear ripped his whole head off. And Octavia Feng, 16, recently won an Academy Award for Best Director. So you can simply put that age in brackets. You can also quote others. So in the newspaper, you can quote what the witnesses said about events. And obviously, you would have to make that up. Don't do it too often or it will sound weird. Once is enough, two to three times maximum, really. Um, and for Cambridge, make sure that you don't copy any words from the exam paper. Never do that. For paper one or for paper two, you will get a much lower mark if you are copying directly from the exam paper. Always try to use your own words. And here's the example that you saw before. So we've got local teenager Daniel Wang, 16, stated, colon, speech marks, and then I made up a quote for the character. Here are some useful phrases that you could use if you were writing a newspaper. According to sources, in light of recent events, the latest developments, it has come to light that, in a surprising turn of events, the current state of affairs, 
in the wake of blah blah blah. It is worth noting that this comes as no surprise given that a growing concern or problem, experts believe that an unprecedented situation, the public's response to event, with mounting pressure, the looming threat of blah blah blah, and the pressing need for blah blah blah. So these are some useful phrases that you can remember for newspaper writing. Okay, now we are going to have a look at an exemplar for newspaper reports, and this is on your worksheet if you would prefer to look at it there. Elmwood High teacher pulls fire alarm, resigns. So notice, very factual, very short, very brief. Let's read. Yesterday afternoon at Elmwood High School, the fire brigade was called to attend to a fire. Yet when they arrived, it became clear that the emergency call triggered by an activated fire alarm was a hoax. Sources report it was one of the school's teachers, Samantha Salmon, 34, who pulled the fire alarm with the sole purpose of avoiding an observation. The incident caused disruptions throughout the school and prompted a public resignation from Salmon. So notice here that after I say her full name and her age, after that, the whole way through, I'm going to refer to her as just Salmon. So do full name and then age, and then after that, just by their surname, by their family name. If we take a look at my introduction then, where is the 5W? So we've got yesterday, which is when. We have got at Elmwood High School, which is the where. We have got what, the fire brigade was called. The who is Salmon. And the why, it was a hoax. So we've got all of the basic facts included in this introduction paragraph. Contrary to conventional fire drills prompted by technical malfunctions or safety exercises, this particular evacuation bore the hallmarks of a deliberate hoax, with the fire alarm activation attributed to the actions of an unexpected perpetrator, the school's English teacher, Salmon. Sources have indicated that the teacher, reportedly facing classroom management challenges with her Year 11 English class, executed a deliberate fire alarm activation as a diversionary tactic, allegedly to evade an impending classroom observation by the school's governor. The school's subsequent tumult was plain to see as fire trucks roared onto the scene and students lined up at the fire assembly point, missing crucial class time. The gravity of the situation was further amplified by the initial suspicion cast upon student Mark Jang, 15. Despite Jang's clean records, the allegations appeared to be misguided. Elmwood has since released a statement clearing Jang of all suspicion. Under the eyes of teachers, students and fire personnel alike, Salmon openly admitted her guilt in the fire alarm activation. Her swift resignation followed this unprecedented act, making this event all the more compelling to concerned citizens. While the circumstances surrounding Salmon's departure from Elmwood High School remain undisclosed, it is evident that the incident has raised into question the school's working practices and workload for teachers. Indeed, Elmwood is one of many schools in the local area facing a shortage of teachers. Salmon is now quickly becoming hailed by online teaching communities as a figurehead for teacher burnout. As Elmwood High School navigates the aftermath of this unanticipated sequence of events, the broader education community reflects upon the complexities in ensuring that schools serve both staff and students alike. The incident serves as a thought-provoking testament to the increasingly turbulent educational landscape in which some teachers would rather pull a fire alarm than enter their classrooms. I enjoyed reading that, that was fun. Okay, so what are we noticing here then about newspaper report tone, the VARP, right? So if we begin at the start then, we are a local journalist, so we should see this idea of like local community. So here we can presume within Cheshire's borders that Elmwood High is in Cheshire and it sounds like the journalist is also from Cheshire. And similarly in this paragraph here, we're hearing about concerned citizens, presumably the local people too. Now notice that the whole way through, I am not using I, so I am avoiding using I. Um, instead, I'm saying what other people think. And rather than saying, I think that the incident serves as a thought provoking testament, saying the incident serves as a thought provoking testament. So we're avoiding the I. You can also notice that I have got Mark Jang and his age in brackets. And then after that, I'm just referring to him by his surname as Jang. And some nice little newspaper register there. The school has since released a statement, right? So all of this statement, sources, lots of newspaper vocabulary in this example. Although there is some emotion in this newspaper example in terms of, you know, 
this makes us question how hard life must be for teachers and there was lots of chaos. It's not very emotional. It's a lot more factual and informative in its tone. Also notice this newspaper language of sources report that. So rather than saying, I found out that, people told me that, I'm taking a step back, the journalist isn't using first person, she's not saying I, she's saying sources report that. And if you think about the list of useful phrases that I gave you, you can see some examples of it here. The school is navigating the aftermath of the unanticipated sequence of events. You can apply that to anything, right? The community, the school is navigating the aftermath. Very simple. And that makes you sound very much like a newspaper. Let's take a look at magazine articles. Here is our prompt for magazine articles. And remember to think about our VARP, our voice audience register purpose and format. Imagine you are a student at a nearby school. Recent events have prompted you to write a magazine article for your school magazine about the need to improve working conditions for teachers. Write the magazine article. So what is our VARP? Beginning then with voice. We are a student. Simple enough. Okay, who is our audience? Uh, well, it's for the school magazine, so the audience must be students as a whole and teachers too, because teachers will, of course, read the school magazine. The register, therefore, I think should be semi-formal. You're not going to be too informal because you're writing to some students who you might not be friends with and your teachers are going to read it. So that's going to affect the type of language that you'll use. But you can still be chatty, upbeat, humorous in terms of your tone. The purpose then, so you are going to inform. And there might also be a purpose of persuading because you want to talk about the need to improve working conditions for teachers. So that might suggest an element of persuasion. And the F, the format, you are writing a magazine article. So that is our vault. Beginning with magazine headlines then. So this will depend on your VARP. Magazines do tend to be more casual than newspapers. They often take on one of two different tones. So the first tone is chatty and humorous, and the second tone is emotive and dramatic. So those are the two kind of registers that most often are appropriate for a magazine article. You'll notice by contrast that newspaper articles, they are formal, unemotional, not really giving their opinion, whereas magazines, chatty, dramatic, right? So that's kind of the difference between the two. Magazine article headlines can use alliteration, they can use puns, plays and words, and they can use emotive language. It will depend on the audience who you're writing to, but often you can use collective pronouns. For this example, we can because we are a student writing for our school magazine. So we can talk about we, us, our, because your writer attends the same place, goes to the same place as their readers. Here are the newspaper headlines we had a look at. Can you turn these into magazine headlines then? So you can use either an emotive tone or a humorous tone, your choice. Have a go. Here are the two examples. The funny ones turned out, I think, quite inappropriate <laughs> given, the, given the topics, but here's, here's some examples. Um, so the first one was for Space Exploration Mission Reaches New Frontier. So a funny, a humorous one. Zooming to the stars, the epic space odyssey that conquered the final frontier. Okay, so zooming to the stars, ha ha ha, space odyssey, ha ha ha. Not that funny, but you know. And then for emotive, Humanity's bold venture into the vast unknown of space exploration. So one is like, oh, cutesy, sci-fi, how cool. And the second one is more like, we are amazing. Humanity is amazing, look at what we're doing. The second one was climate change crisis sparks global call to action. This is one that's quite inappropriate as a funny one. So hot mess planet. How climate change is giving the earth a major makeover. Ah, so inappropriate. Um, but you see the kind of tone, right? A plain words, hot mess, because you can describe a person as being a hot mess. That would be me, but you can, like if someone looks really bad. And then giving the earth a major makeover relates back to hot mess. But the makeover in this case is that we're all at risk of extinct. <laughs> we're all at risk of extinction. Moving on. The urgent global call to protect our precious planet from climate change. That one's a bit better, I think. And then the third one that you had to change was world leaders gather for historic peace summit. So a funny one, 
will be A-listers unite. <laughs> the ultimate peace party you don't want to miss. And then emotive embracing peace. World leaders unite for a historic summit to heal our worn torn our war torn world. Hopefully you can see just by looking at these headlines the kind of tone that you're going for compared to newspapers. Here are some magazine articles for you to take a look at. I tried to get a variety. So over here we have got 17 magazine and just take a notice of all of the puns, all of the plain words, all of the slang and it's general register how informal it is. So first we've got cheap and chic. So we've got some alliteration and also chic would be, is it slang? It's definitely informal. It's also quite brief if you take a look at the bullet points here. Clothes, hair, makeup, places to go, things to do. Mm -hmm. Mind games, guys play. So rather than how men emotionally and psychologically manipulate you, <laughs> um, we've got we've got guys instead of men and mind games, which is some slang. Sexy tops. Okay, a little bit inappropriate for a magazine aimed at teenagers, but I guess. And we'll also notice here, we've got the word trashy. So again, some more slang. And then a quote from Miss Britney Spears herself. The things I did weren't very cool. Okay, sure, Britney. And a, another bit of slang there for us. And over here, we've got men's fashion magazine. So we've got Ryan Reynolds from buried to unbottled. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. Um, a travel special, an A to Z of places to be. So we've got a little bit of rhyme there. Z, Z, depends on if, what your accent is, I suppose. But we've got rhyme and A to Z. Mark Jacobs, bang on. And again, some slang. Test driving the world's hottest wheels. Again, some more slang. And both of these magazines using celebrities too, suggesting a less serious subject matter. By contrast then, our last one is Time Magazine, which tends to be a much more serious magazine to give you an idea of perhaps something that might be more emotional and a little bit dramatic rather than just being humorous. So here we have got Greta Gerwig, director of Barbie movie on the front cover. And we've got lights, camera, power. So that's a play on words because usually it would be lights, camera, action. And here power has been swapped out to play in the words to emphasize the importance of Greta Gerwig's work, how women are redirecting Hollywood, another pun because she's a director, she was directing the film, but here it's being played around with to show she's actually redirecting the film industry itself. Um, so we can see a much more serious tone here, but it's still playing with language, whereas a newspaper article probably wouldn't do that. General advice for a magazine article tone, it's usually semi-formal, I say, think about how a 40 year old math teacher with a cheesy sense of humour would write. That's the kind of tone that you want to take on. If, you, if you've got a teacher like that, just imagine that you're him or her. Um, and this can be a funny or witty tone depending on the topic. For example, there is a past paper for Cambridge about an oil spill where penguins die. So if you were humorous about that, it wouldn't be appropriate. But if you're going to be humorous and witty, you can use alliteration, puns and a chatty tone. Or if you're going to be emotional because you've got a serious topic, you can be more emotive and dramatic in your language. And for those of you in the UK for reference, it's more similar to a tabloid. So magazine is like a tabloid, newspaper is like a broadsheet. Here are some useful magazine phrases that you could use in a magazine that you write. In a surprising turn of events, with growing interest, as it turns out, as reported by, it's worth noting that the numbers speak for themselves, taking a closer look as the story unfolds, as we delve into the details, as many are aware, in a dramatic twist, what's fascinating is, digging deeper, upon closer examination, this raises the question, a trend that's on the rise, it's no surprise that, as history has shown, what's remarkable about this is, what's striking is, in a significant development, an essential factor to remember, as it was anticipated, what becomes evident is, in a notable departure from, as many may recall, what's becoming increasingly clear is. Now let's take a look at our magazine article exemplar and do have a think how this differs from the newspaper exemplar. 
So one of the big things that's changed is, whereas before we were a local journalist, now we are a student at a nearby school to Elmwood. So we've got a big shift there in terms of voice. And whereas the audience of the newspaper was just a general local audience, the audience of this magazine article is other students. So we're gonna definitely expect a more semi-formal tone compared to the newspaper. Teacher's blazing exit leaves Elmwood in shock. Blazing, ha, pun, because fire, right? Pun, playing words. Look, I'm already making myself laugh. At Knightsbridge High, we are blessed with fantastic facilities, a record-breaking football team and professional teachers. But our rivals over at Elmwood High School aren't so lucky, throwing shade on their rival school. Picture this, a typical day, a regular classroom, and then... Chaos in shoes. Spelling mistake there, let me fix that. Fixed. <laughs> a fire alarm goes off, sending students scurrying outside like startled ants. The cause? Not a faulty toaster in the staff room, nor a Bunsen burner gone awry. This wasn't your average fire drill. It was a master plan by none other than their English teacher, Miss Salmon. Rumour has it that Miss Salmon was facing a classroom battleground, struggling to tame the wild spirits of her year 11 English class. And with Miss Salmon due to be observed that very afternoon, in a desperate attempt to dodge the scrutiny, she pulled off the ultimate escape, pulling the fire alarm lever. Now I know our year 11s are lively, but I doubt Miss Jones would ever get the fire brigade out to avoid teaching Shakespeare. So we can see this is a student, so the student's a little bit impressed with Miss Salmon. <laughs> I mean, I think they may, I think you would be, so it's a little bit of juicy gossip for them. Um, and it's also clear that they are a student at a nearby school, right? So we've got their teacher as kind of like an inside joke with their audience. And we've also got references to our, right? Our rivals, because the student is writing to other students. We are blessed with fantastic facilities. So we've got already that sense of audience. Let's carry on. At Elmwood, the school was in uproar that afternoon. Fire trucks blaring, students spilling out like they were running for gold. The plot thickened as suspicion fell on innocent Mark Jang, who incidentally attended Knightsbridge when he was in year seven. Doubtless none of you will remember him, as he could barely speak without stuttering, yet our peers over at Elmwood deemed Jang a criminal extraordinaire. Sources say Jang looked as bewildered as we did when we discovered this wild turn of events. So I added a little, a little something in. Mark used to attend this student school before he moved over to the rival school. So yeah, I, had, I added a little something in. Um, but again, look at this, addressing the audience, a little bit of a joke, like, oh, they thought he set the fire alarm off, but we can't even remember him speaking. How could they possibly think this innocent boy did that? And again, sources say, so similar to newspaper in that sense, you can quote what other people say. But the vocabulary and tone is definitely more emotive. The school is in uproar, the fire trucks were blaring, the students were spilling out, the plot thickened. It definitely sounds like the student writing this magazine article was quite enjoying um, <laughs> being critical and writing about all of this gossip. Um, even to the fact that they called it a wild turn of events. So definitely a more semi-formal tone here. But here's where it gets interesting. Miss Salmon herself stepped up in front of the whole student body, confessing to her fiery caper and then dropping a resignation bomb. Talk about an exit strategy. Rumour has it that she handed in her resignation letter that day and hasn't been seen at Elmwood since. While Miss Salmon may have set off some alarms, literally, one thing's for sure. She just gave everyone something to talk about for weeks. From classroom antics to fiery exits, Elmwood High School has officially won the award for most unpredictable day ever. So remember, dear readers, while we're stuck in our school routines, wild tales like these are unfolding just a street away. Definitely seen some more semi-formal language now. We've even got exclamation marks too here. We've got a little bit of a joke in the brackets. Some more emotive language, like her fiery exit, her resignation bomb, her fiery caper, so some more puns as well. And once more, a nod to the audience. We are stuck in our school routine, so that's definitely creating that sense of, I am a student at the same school as you, we're all enjoying this gossip together. Let's take a look at speeches now. Here is our speech prompt. Imagine you are Miss Salmon. After quitting teaching, you give a speech at a teacher's conference about your experience and the need to improve working conditions for teachers. Write the words of the speech. 
So what is your voice, audience, register, purpose, and format? What is your VARP? So voice then, we are Miss Salmon. So we are a mid-30s female teacher, right? So that's me. <laughs> Not mid-30s, yeah. Okay, so therefore we're going to be semi-formal? I mean, it depends on her personality. We haven't got a sense of it yet. But certainly she wouldn't be using lots and lots of slang. She wouldn't be swearing and so on and so forth. Um, who is her audience? She's talking at a teacher's conference. So she's talking to other teachers. So that's our audience. Therefore, her register would definitely be, I think, slightly more formal than she would normally speak. She would be respectful. And she is someone who's doing the same job as them. So she might have some inside jokes and try to create a sense of we're all in this together. I understand you, you understand me because we do the same job or did the same job. The purpose then is to talk about the need to improve working conditions. So it might be persuasive and informative. And what is the format? Well, you are writing a speech. Now for speech writing, probably you guys might think of people like this, John F. Kennedy, Greta Thunberg, Martin Luther King. But Cambridge will not ask you to write a political speech. Usually the speeches on Cambridge are more like a talk um, rather than being like very, very emotive. So usually the purpose is more to inform than to persuade. Persuade might be a secondary purpose, but your main purpose will be to inform like in this task. Now, remember that a speech is a spoken form. You're giving a speech using your mouth to a live audience. So you need to create that sense of audience by talking to them. In other words, you need to address your audience and reference them throughout your speech. So you can even open your speech with phrases like these. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for gathering here today. Hello everyone, and welcome to my talk about blah, blah, blah. I'm so pleased to see such bright and smiling faces here to learn more about blah, blah, blah. Because of this, it's really useful to think about your pronouns. So you should speak directly to your audience to be more persuasive. So you could use collective pronouns like we, our, us, and personal pronouns like you, your, and yours. Speeches are often a good opportunity to use rhetorical questions. A reminder that a rhetorical question is a question that doesn't require an answer. It's a persuasive technique and its purpose is to make your audience think about something, to ponder the topic, or to suggest that the answer to your question is so obvious it doesn't need a response. Like, we can all agree on this, right? For example, don't you love studying English? That's rhetorical because the answer is so obvious, it's yes. Some examples here. Do you think it's right to watch our children starve? Will the rich grow fatter in their mansions? What will you do to help your community? What will you tell your children in years to come? So these rhetorical questions here, suggesting clearly the answer is no, it's not okay to watch children starve while other people grow rich. And also the second one to make the reader think, genuinely, what will you tell your children about what you did to help in this situation? Probably because the speaker is assuming the audience isn't doing enough, they want them to do more. So they want them to think, what will I tell my children? Ah, I will have to tell them I did nothing, feel ashamed. Hmm, maybe I should do more. In a speech, you can also use some repetition, which is where you repeat words or phrases for emphasis. Because remember, a speech is supposed to be spoken out loud. And so when we repeat things, it sounds good. An example from Martin Luther King. I have a dream that one day all people will be equal. I have a dream that one day our society can heal itself. And my dream, our dream, we can only achieve this dream if we dream together as one, strive together as one united force. So we have the repetition of I have a dream and just dream more generally and repetition of as one, as one, right? Because it sounds good. Maybe it doesn't sound as good when, it definitely doesn't sound as good when I read it as Martin Luther King, but you get the idea. And similarly, we can also use some emotive language. So emotional and powerful language to try and create a response in the reader. To do this, really think about your vocabulary choices. Example, do you think it's right to watch our children starve or the rich grow fatter in their mansions? Should we watch as innocents wither and die, their mouths empty, their souls abandoned by this very society that was charged to protect them? Um, so some emotive language in here, children starving, um, they are innocents, they are withering, they are dying, their mouths are empty, 
they've been abandoned, their souls, and that we as a society were supposed to protect them. So being quite dramatic and emotional in the language choices here. Here are some useful phrases for speeches. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to share. Let's take a moment to... Fellow professionals, enthusiasts, citizens, I'm here to discuss... I want to talk to you about... Each of you plays a crucial role in... Everyone in this room knows the importance of... I'm speaking to you today because... Think about this. Let's consider how this affects each and every one of us. As individuals who care deeply about... I know many of you may have experienced... For those of you who've been through... To the future leaders and innovators in this room... In your daily lives you might have encountered... As we gather here, I want you to reflect on. Now let me ask you, I'm sure you can relate to, it's a privilege to be speaking to such an attentive group. Remember that together we can. So a common theme here is lots of you and lots of us, right? So you see that the whole way through these speeches. Now let's take a look at my speech exemplar, which remember is Miss Salmon talking to a group of teachers at a teachers conference. Ladies and gentlemen, Educators of the UK and esteemed colleagues, thank you for allowing me to address you today. I stand before you not as a cautionary tale, but as a fellow educator, sharing a pivotal moment that changed the course of my career. On one fateful day at Elmwood High School, I found myself at a crossroads, where the challenges I faced in my Year 11 English class seemed insurmountable. An impending classroom observation weighed heavily on my shoulders, and the lack of control over challenging classes had me feeling like a captain steering a ship caught in a storm. In my quest to create an environment of learning and growth, I made a choice that, in hindsight, I recognise as both desperate and misguided. I'm sure many of you here today know the heart-pounding dread that accompanies an observation, but that day I think I transcended heart-pounding and skipped straight to beautiful madness. I walked out of my classroom and set off a fire alarm. So beginning straight away then with ladies and gentlemen and recognising that they are also teachers. She calls them colleagues, like workmates. So we've definitely got a sense of audience and she's being very polite. So she's being formal, polite and inclusive. Like we all understand because we've all done the same job. She's addressing them directly using you and she calls herself a fellow educator because she's talking to a room full of students. Also notice here she addresses them She's trying to get some sympathy, really. I'm sure many of you here today know the heart-pounding dread that accompanies an observation. Like, you guys know how stressful it is, so, like, give me some empathy, essentially. Now, please do not mistake me. At that moment, I didn't want either chaos or a simple escape. I just wanted one moment of peace, and that would have been enough. That might tell you something about what my mental state was, because, you see, it wasn't this one observation or this one class... No, as educators, you all know that the stresses of teaching cannot be quantified in single measures. The stress, workload and pressure were unrelenting. Six periods a day, five days a week, plus meetings, plus duties, plus extracurricular activities, plus trips, plus parents' evenings, plus open evenings, plus attempting to improve my teaching enough to get a promotion, because I certainly couldn't afford a decent house and a teacher's salary, so I'd have to climb the greasy pole. No. At that moment, I just needed 10 seconds with a wailing fire alarm bell to allow myself to breathe for the first time in 12 months. So here getting into the argument about mental health, workload, stress, basically it was all too much that this was the most relaxed she had been in the last year. Pulling the fire alarm was <laughs> the most relaxing moment for Miss Salmon's life, according to her. And we're seeing in this paragraph here, she's, direct, she's directly addressing her audience. Please do not mistake me. She's begging them to kind of understand her. And again, we've got lots of you the whole way through this too. And because you see. But then we've also got some persuasive techniques. We've got this repetition, right? The plus, 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 plus to kind of emphasise how many things teachers have to do all piling up and up and up. And a sense of irony too, that the most quiet and relaxation she's getting is with this wailing fire alarm, which should really tell you, the reader and the audience, just how stressed Miss Salmon was. 
My dear colleagues, this experience has taught me the invaluable lesson that we are people first, educators second. It's about recognising when we need help and recognising when our jobs become untenable. I loved my students. I loved teaching. But somewhere in that classroom, I forgot how to breathe. And the great irony is that many would describe what I did as a false alarm. True, in terms of fires. But in terms of my mental health, it was anything but. I needed that moment to be honest with myself, that my time as a teacher had to end. So here the argument, okay, it was a false alarm for a fire, but it wasn't a false alarm. Like I pulled that because I needed help. I did need help. And so I quit. Don't worry, don't worry, I owned up first. My apologies to Mark Chang, who initially got the blame for my actions. But yes, I handed in my resignation on that same day. Now I work as a mental health advocate for those in the education sector, trying to find ways to keep passionate teachers in the classroom and reassuring those on the verge of setting off the alarm that it's okay to say when enough is enough. Thank you for being a fantastic audience. Take care of yourselves. So here we have got, again, addressing the audience, my dear colleagues, and thank you for being a fantastic audience. Take care of yourselves. Um, and also like this kind of conversational tone here with don't worry, don't worry, like like your teacher, so I know you're gonna be annoyed at me that a student took the blame. I, I owned up. <laughs> so she's she's recognizing the audience there. Again, we've got some repetition. I loved my students, I loved teaching. And overall, just creating this emotive and passionate tone without being informal in any way. You will see that there is no slang and the tone is pretty formal the whole way throughout. But that's because of our VORP, right? Because it's a teacher talking at a teacher's conference in a professional context, of course, this is going to be a more formal talk. Moving on to interviews now. Here is our interview prompt. Think about the VORP. That's voice, audience, register, purpose, and format. Imagine you are a presenter at a local radio station. You interview the headmaster of Elmwood High about the events of that day. Write the words of the interview. Take a look at this prompt. What is the VORP? The voice then is headmaster. This is the main thing that you're going to have to write as. Yes, that there's a presenter, but Cambridge will give you those questions, so you are not the presenter. Who is the audience? Well, the audience is people who listen to the local radio show. So local listeners is your audience. Therefore, the register. Well, we've got a headmaster, we've got radio, and we've got local audience. Well, together, I would say that's more formal, more polite. But then there's also this spoken element, right, of two people having a conversation, which might make it slightly more semi-formal. It depends on what kind of voice you want to create for the headmaster, like what sort of character he would appear to be in the extract. Now, obviously, for this one, we haven't got an extract, so you can make that up. The purpose is you're talking about the events of the day, so the purpose is to inform and the format is an interview. So overall, we have got like a slightly more formal tone, but it is spoken so we can have a little bit of banter back and forth between the interviewer and the interviewee. Now for Cambridge, when they ask you to write an interview, that is nine times out of 10, a radio interview or a TV interview. That's what you're gonna be asked to write. They won't ask you to write a job interview. <laughs> So it tends to be that you will interview a character in the text that you've been given. And often that isn't the main character, so make sure you check carefully who you're writing as. Essentially, you're thinking about a podcast tone. It's a talk between two people on the given topic. And so the formality will vary. It will depend on the text, the characters that you're being asked to write about, and the topic that you've been given. But because it's spoken, interviews do tend to be more often than not a semi-formal type of text. For interview writing, Cambridge will give you three questions. So they will give you the questions that the interviewer will ask and then your job is to write the responses. Those three questions are your bullet points. So they're very important for your reading marks. Therefore, you should copy down those questions exactly. Don't change them, right? Don't add in your own questions because then you're going to go off topic and you're going to get a lower reading mark. And your interviewee should do 95% of the talking because that's where you're going to pick up your reading marks. How should you actually write it? Well, you should lay it out like a script like this. So you'll put the person's name and colons, leave a little bit of a space and then write down what they say. Example, Andy. So Kayla, tell me why do you love English so much? Kayla, well, because of Miss O'Rourke, of course. So this is how it should look. 
like this, like a speech. If you want to, you can also add in stage directions, but it's not needed if you don't want. Do this by using brackets like laughs, nods, claps, something like that. Again, you don't have to do it, but it does sound quite nice. It does sound quite realistic for an interview tone. Now, because it's spoken, you should use spoken language. So you can use filler words or thinking words like, well, I guess, huh, I hadn't thought of that before. But don't do that too much or it will start to sound weird. And you can also use punctuation to make your writing sound more spoken. For example, you can use ellipses to show a pause or a dash to show that the speaker's changed the direction in their sentence. For example, Mark Jank was accused well, let's not bother with that. And you put the dash in between to show he's changing the topic. You can also use an exclamation mark to place emphasis or show excitement. But again, don't use these punctuation marks too much or it will start to sound a little bit strange. As with speech writing, don't forget to use personal pronouns because the interviewee and interviewer, they're speaking to each other, right? It's two people in conversation. So you should try to make it sound like a real conversation by using you, your and yours. Have your interviewee speak directly to the interviewer. For example, you really can't imagine. Don't look so surprised, right? So two people talking to each other. Here are some useful phrases that you can use for interview writing. For those tuning in, I want you to consider. Listeners, keep this in mind as we discuss. To all of you out there, I encourage you to think about if you're listening right now, I want you to imagine. To everyone joining us, I'm sure you'll find this interesting. I'm sure many of you can relate to. As you're listening, you might be wondering. I want to share a perspective with you that could resonate with some of you. You might be surprised to learn that. Consider this a takeaway for each and every one of you. That's an excellent question. Here's my take on it. To answer your question, let me explain. Your question really touches on something I'm very passionate about. Funny you should ask, because the idea actually came to me when. Now let's take a look at an example interview. Interviewer. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We have a rather intriguing story for you today. Fresh from the halls of Elmwood High School, joining us is the school's head teacher, Mr. Reginald Wellington. Welcome, Mr. Wellington. So remember for Cambridge, you just copy out their questions, but I couldn't resist. I, I, I had to create my own voice. <laughs> Mr. Wellington. Thank you. Thank you, my dear. It's always such a pleasure to share my wisdom and insights with the public. Mr. Wellington, the incident that unfolded at your school has everyone talking. Could you shed some light on the events that transpired during the fire alarm incident? Ah, yes. The fiery escape, as they're calling it. You see, my dear, it all started with our darling Miss Salmon, a teacher who seemed to have lost her way in the labyrinth of classroom management. She was facing a rather daunting observation and, well, I suppose she thought pulling the fire alarm was the best way to avoid the impending scrutiny. Quite the audacious move, I must say. It certainly was a dramatic turn of events. Speaking of which, the blame initially fell on a Year 9 student, Mark Jang. How did that happen? And what does this incident tell us about the school's disciplinary measures? Ah, oh, Mark Jan, poor lad. It was a classic case of misunderstanding, I assure you. In the chaos that ensued, the poor boy found himself in the spotlight. Not for his own doing, mind you. It's a reminder that we must always be thorough in our investigations. A lesson we shall take to our heart in our ongoing efforts to maintain discipline and order within our beloved institution. Of course, of course. And who was it that accused Mark then? Never mind that now, all water under the bridge, as they say. It was him. And finally, Mr. Wellington, the resignation of Miss Salmon was a surprising development. How do you see this incident affecting the future of Elmwood High School? Well, my dear, I believe that every cloud has a silver lining and Miss Salmon's resignation, while abrupt, may offer an opportunity for fresh ideas and a renewed sense of dedication within our staff. It's crucial that we strive for excellence, and this incident has certainly provided us with a moment for reflection. The future of Elmwood High School, rest assured, will continue to shine brighter than ever before. Thank you, Mr Wellington, for your insights into this fascinating tale from Elmwood High School. It seems the dramatic world of education always keeps us on our toes. Now, if we take a look and have a think about it, 
Who's the local audience? Well, it's probably going to be parents or potential parents. So obviously Mr. Wellington has to make the incident seem less serious than it was and reassure the local listeners, our school is still great, still send your kids here, right? So we've got kind of like a, an ulterior motive from the head teacher. And so over here, he doesn't want to admit blame, right? That it was him that unjustly accused a student. And he's saying the future of Elmwood High School is going to shine brighter than ever before. So we've got this kind of reassurance to the audience. I wanted to create like a slightly patronizing tone, like <laughs> for the head teacher. Um, so we can see the whole way through, he's referring to the interviewer as my dear, which is quite patronizing and a bit sexist. And we've also got these filler words like, well, while he thinks of what to say. We can see that the interviewer is referring to Mr. Wellington by name, which creates a, a sense of relationship between the two speakers. And again, this spoken tone here in, of course, of course, and ah, Mark Jang, poor lad. And again, here we've also got the ah, the thinking word, ah, yes, the fiery escape as they're calling it. Here, talking to the interviewer directly again, you see, my dear. Another thinking word here with the well. Um, she was facing a rather daunting observation and, well, I suppose, as he thinks, and again, we've got an exclamation mark here to add a more spoken tone to it as well. Now let's take a look at letter writing. Here is our letter writing prompt. Have a think about the VORP, the voice, audience, register, purpose and format of this question. Imagine you are Miss Salmon. Recent events have prompted you to write a letter to your mother to tell her what happened and what you plan to do next. Write the letter. So what is the VORP? Have a think. So firstly, we have got the voice is Miss Salmon, um, who is the audience to her mother. So now she's not speaking to a teaching conference anymore. So we're gonna expect probably therefore that the register is going to be more semi-formal. She's not gonna use slang to her mother, right? She's not going to speak. She's not going to speak in, in such an informal way. Um, she's still gonna be polite to her mother, but they have got a close relationship. So it's not gonna be very formal. The purpose is to tell her about what happened and what you plan to do next. So the purpose is to inform and the format is a letter. Here's some general letter writing advice for you. So firstly, you should always begin a letter with a greeting. If you're not sure what to do, simply begin it with dear and then their name. Um, if the text on question three doesn't give you a friend's name, you can make one up. So very formal would be dear Mr. Jang, Kind of semi-formal would be Dear Joel and slightly more informal would be Hi. Did I say Joel before? <laughs> no. And slightly more informal would be Hi Noel. Voice, you really need to think about who you're writing as, so you should try to create a character. Is your character serious, chatty, immature, thoughtful, intelligent? And how will you show those characteristics through your writing? So for example, for Miss Salmon, I think she must be intelligent and thoughtful. Um, and I think she's probably having quite a hard time, so maybe a bit stressed too. So how am I going to show that voice to my character of Miss Salmon? So you've got your character, you've got who you're writing as, then you need to think, okay, who am I writing to? And you need to create a sense of audience. Now you need to remember that in this case, for this prompt, a woman writing to her mother, they're very close. They've got a lot of shared history, a lot of shared past. So you need to make that relationship and that history seem real, seem realistic. So you need to think about what relationship do they have to each other and how will that affect their language choices? Really important too, have your characters ever met before? Now, if Miss Salmon was writing a letter to the education board or to a politician, clearly that would be a lot more formal, but writing to her mother who probably knows her better than anyone in the world, that relationship is really going to have an effect on our language choices. So if you're close friends and family, you want to show that you've got a close relationship by referring to things that the person already knows about you or shared memories. For example, you know I've always been passionate about teaching, education. I wish you could have seen it yourself. You would have laughed yourself silly. So like anticipating, I know you, I know how you would react to this situation. Please don't get mad. Oh, like you would have found that so funny. I know you would have loved it. How would that person that you're writing to respond to what you're saying if they were there in person with you or a shared memory remember when we went to Australia well it was 10 times even hotter than then or like remember when I cried at the school disco I cried even harder than that right so talking about those shared memories together 
By contrast, if you're writing to someone who is less close, like a boss or a company director, clearly your sense of audience is going to become a lot more formal. So you can use phrases like these instead. I'm writing to you today concerning the matter of blah, blah, blah. As a loyal team member, our business's reputation is of the utmost importance to me. And I hope you will consider my thoughts above and we can work together to find a resolution to this matter. And don't forget to include a sign off. This is the thing that students always forget. Like they get it all perfect and then they just end the letter with no sign off. And I'm like, why? How did you even do this? So you should always sign off your letter with your name and you can make up a forename or a surname for your character if the text doesn't say. So for example, if Miss Salmon is just called Miss Salmon, you make up a first name. You call her Samantha, fine. Um, so very formal will be your sincerely, Mr. Jang. In the middle will be best wishes, Noel, and slightly more informal will be lots of love, Noel. I would probably only put lots of love for parents and best friends. People that you actually love, right? Two sides here then. So I'm gonna give you some useful letter phrases for formal letters, and then on the next slide will be for informal or semi-formal letters. So beginning then with phrases for formal letters. Dear recipient's name, I would go with their surname, like dear Miss O'Rourke. To whom it may concern, and that's when you're writing to a broader audience, like a group of people, or when you don't know the audience's name. I would like to inform you that I am reaching out with regard to. Your prompt attention to this matter is appreciated. I kindly request that you. I would appreciate it if you could. I hope you will consider my proposal. I am looking forward to. Thank you for your attention to this matter. I look forward to hearing from you at your earliest convenience. Sincerely, yours faithfully, yours sincerely. For semi-formal letters, dear name, hey, name or nickname, it's been a while since we last caught up. I wanted to write and share some exciting news. I hope everything is going well in your end. I thought you'd be interested to know that. Guess what happened recently? Is everything going smoothly on your end? I've been wondering what's new in your life. Your support has meant a lot to me. I'm thrilled to share that. I couldn't wait to tell you about. I'm excited to hear your thoughts on this. We should definitely catch up soon. It will be wonderful to hear your thoughts on. Maybe we can meet up for. Take care and talk to you soon. Stay in touch. Until we chat again. Love. Best wishes. Yours truly. Now let's take a look at the exemplar, which remember is Miss Salmon writing to her mum. Hi mum, I hope this letter finds you well, being your fabulous self. I wanted to share something that happened at school recently and let me warn you up front that you might not be too proud of my actions, but I hope you'll be proud of what I plan to do next. You know how my year 11 class has been giving me a hard time, right? Well, it reached a boiling point and I did something out of character, but I wanted to tell you about it because I value your advice and perspective. So notice here, that we've got like a little bit of a joke, her mum is fabulous um, and she's anticipating that her mum probably will not be proud of what she did. So creating that sense of audience, like I know what you're like and how you're going to react. And also the fact that her mum already knows about the year 11 English class makes it sound like, yes, they're very close. Um, and notice that we've got some more informal language like right and well, and again, a sense of relationship. Why is she writing? Because she values her mum's perspective. So I was due to be observed with my nightmare year 11s and the students were, well, let's say not making it easy. They're a tough bunch and I was feeling the pressure. In the middle of that chaos, I felt like I was having an out of body experience. And before I knew it, I'd left my classroom. I just couldn't face the observation. And honestly, the thought of attempting to teach that lot for one more second decided it for me. I pulled the fire alarm. I know, I know, it was a stupid thing to do, but I was desperate for an escape from the situation. So again here, I know, I know, because she knows what her mum would say to her about this. And again, we've got some more informal language like I'd instead of I would. And also putting honestly here makes it sound more informal. And also referring to the students as a tough bunch and somewhere else it calls them a lot. Where was it? And teaching that lot. So rather than, oh, this group of students, this class, that's quite informal language to refer to the class. Here's the worst bit, mum. They blamed Mark Jang, this year nine kid who's the least likely suspect ever. The poor guy looked bewildered and I couldn't let him take the blame for something he didn't do. 
So I did the right thing eventually, or at least I hope it was the right thing. I stepped up and admitted it was me who pulled the alarm. And you know what? I've decided to resign from my teaching position at Elmwood High, maybe from teaching altogether. This could be a chance for me to regroup and find a new path where I can still make a difference, but with less stress and fewer 16 year olds. So again, notice we've got this kind of spoken chatty tone with the dot, dot, dot and the, and you know what? So we've got this more informal tone. And again here, eventually in brackets, giving almost like an inside joke tone to the writing. I know it might sound ridiculous, but I believe this is what's best. I need time to figure things out, rekindle that passion for teaching and maybe explore new avenues. Your support has always meant the world to me and I just wanted to let you know what's been going on. I promise to keep you in the loop as I navigate this unexpected journey. Maybe I could even come and stay for a little bit while I get myself sorted. Promise I'll do the dishes. Thanks for being the best mum an ex-teacher could ask for. Lots of love, Sammy, kiss. So notice here we've got lots of love because obviously you would love your mum. Sammy instead of Samantha, so we've got a nickname and also a kiss too. Definitely getting a sense of a relationship. She's asking to stay, she's being a bit cheeky and promise I'll do the dishes rather than I promise I will do the dishes. So quite informal language and implying that in the past she didn't do the dishes, she wasn't very clean. So definitely creating that sense of realism there. She keeps referring to her mother as you and like saying, you know, I really appreciate you and you're the best mum a teacher could ask for. So it definitely sounds like she's writing to her mum. And that's our letter exemplar. Let's take a look at diary writing now. Here is our diary writing prompt. As we have a look at it, do think about what our VORP is, which remember is our voice, audience, register, purpose and format. Imagine you are Mark Jung, the student unfairly accused of setting off the fire alarm. Recent events have prompted you to write a diary entry about what happened that day and your reaction to Miss Salmon's confession. Write the diary entry. Have a think now, what is the VORP? Let's take a look now then. So voice, we are Mark Jang. He's a student, so it's more likely to be semi-formal. And we've learned through the other letters that he is kind of a quiet kid, shy. You wouldn't really expect him to be someone that's set off the fire alarm. Who is the audience? Well, he's writing a diary, so he's writing to himself, right? So therefore the register is going to be, he's a teenager writing a diary to himself, so it's definitely gonna be more semi-formal um, and more confessional, telling secrets, telling emotions. That would be the tone. What is the purpose? Well, it is to inform about what happened in the day and also to unload a little bit. And the format is a diary. Now, if you see the word journal in a past paper, that means a diary, right? So journal and diary, same thing. If Cambridge asks you to write a journal, they mean a diary, okay? So same thing. Now your tone of voice for a diary is gonna heavily depend on the character that you've been asked to write as. So the language used in the diary isn't always the same. A teenager would sound very different from an academic professor in their diary, for example. So it really depends on the character. But it would be very strange for a diary to be extremely formal, um, unless, as I said, you're a snobby university professor who takes life too seriously. It's much more common that a diary will be semi-formal. So you should be using correct spelling, punctuation and grammar, avoid using too much slang, but you can be a little bit more chatty in your tone. You should give a diary a greeting and a sign off. I don't know why we do this. It's kind of like a letter to yourself. So you can begin the diary with dear diary and finish the diary by writing your name. If you don't do it though, you won't lose any marks in Cambridge, but that is how diaries are usually written. Don't forget to be using past tense. So a diary should be using past tense because you're describing events in your life that have already happened to you in the past. So many students forget to use past tense. I don't know why. However, Current feelings or reflections about those events can use present tense because that's what you're currently thinking, currently feeling. So for example, he stole my bag and ran away. This is both past because these are events that have happened to us. But I think he's a jerk is in present because that's how the writer currently still feels about the person that stole the bag. Now in a diary, you should try to take on a confessional tone. You should tell secrets or personal emotions that your character might not normally admit. And this is actually really great for your question three because it will help you to get some more development points. For example, you can say things like, I would never admit this to anyone, but 
Secretly, I must say I felt rather upset about the whole incident. I tried my best not to show how scared I felt. So use that confessional secretive tone. You're writing a diary to yourself so you can be completely honest. Remember that diaries aren't stories, so avoid writing a narrative. You don't need to have a climax, plot or dialogue, right? You're not writing a story. And so perhaps you're thinking, well, I, I shouldn't use dialogue. Well, what should I do then? Remember that when you're writing a diary, you can't remember later on word for word what someone said. It would be really weird for you to do that in a diary. So instead of saying, will you come over here, please, Emma? I'd like to talk to you about something, Mrs. Ashford said which you wouldn't write in a diary. Instead, you should write, Mrs. Ashford asked me to come over to her since there was something she wanted to tell me about. So instead you will report the speech, you will summarize the speech, but you won't write it like dialogue, you won't quote it. In diaries, you can often use some features of spoken language a little bit. Um, so for example, you can use exclamation marks and ellipses to show your emotion and create that more spoken tone of voice. For example, well, I didn't know what to do in that situation. I never do. I couldn't believe my eyes, right? So you're creating a little bit of emotion by using that punctuation. Here are some useful diary phrases. Dear diary, today was quite an adventure. I can't help but feel. It's been on my mind lately. I'll never forget the moment when. I find myself wondering. I've been struggling with. This day has been full of surprises. I can't shake off this feeling of, this experience has taught me. I've realized that I'm at a crossroads. In my heart, I know that. It's been a roller coaster of emotions. I wish I could turn back time and I'm proud of myself for, today I made a promise to myself. This little moment made my day. There's a certain magic in, I'm taking a leap of faith and I'm blessed to have. This experience has shown me I'm starting to see the bigger picture. Now let's take a look at our diary example, which remember is Mark Jang, the year nine boys diary. Dear diary, today school was unbelievable. It all started in Miss Salmon's year 11 English class. You know, the one where everyone usually messes around and she's been trying so hard to keep us in line. I guess the teachers call it classroom management, but for us, it's just another day of dodging Shakespeare and pretending to care about literature. So we've got this little bit of a sarcastic, rebellious teenage tone going on here. Anyway, today was different. The classroom felt like a ticking time bomb and Miss was on edge. She was supposed to be observed. She warned us yesterday with threats of detention and she was worried about it. We've seen her struggle with our rowdy bunch and as much as we drive her up the wall, I know she genuinely cares about us. We may not be the best behaved lot, but we can sense when someone's trying, you know? So as the class dragged on, I noticed she seemed distracted, like she was somewhere else entirely. I even heard her muttering to herself a couple of times. Notice then some of the more informal language, like the exclamation mark over here, and beginning a sentence with anyway. Um, and we've got the brackets over here to create kind of like a side, I'm talking to you to the side. We've got you know, question mark, and so. So we've got lots of informal language here. And similar to one of the earlier extracts, referring to a class as lot and rowdy bunch, again, is slightly more informal, but we haven't got outright slang. Like he's not saying, oh, that was so based or whatever teenagers say these days. So it's more like kind of chatty language than slang language. Then out of nowhere, the fire alarm goes off. Chaos erupted and everyone started rushing out like we were escaping a monster or something. It's unbelievable how fast we all bolted as if our lives depended on it. But the real shocker came when the head teacher accused me, me, of pulling the fire alarm. Honestly, why me? Sure, I've been part of some pranks, but this was way beyond anything I'd ever done. It felt like a deer caught in headlights. The more innocent I tried to look, the guiltier I felt. Then, while the accusations were thrown at me, Miss Salmon stepped up. I could see in her eyes that mix of guilt and relief when her eyes met mine. She gave me this kind of sad smile, and then she confessed to setting off the fire alarm. I thought surely it couldn't be true. She must be taking the fall for something she didn't do to protect me. Her voice quivered as she admitted it, and there was this look on her face like she'd been through the ringer and couldn't handle it anymore. And then, in the blink of an eye, she resigned. Just like that. Then I realised she'd been telling the truth. She really had set off the fire alarm. So we've got these emotions and like confessions, like 
I tried to look innocent, but then I just felt more guilty. And like this idea of like, oh, I looked my teacher in the eyes. She, she gave me a sad, sad smile. I thought she was trying to protect me. Probably things that a teenage boy might not say to his friends, but definitely would think like, oh, this teacher's actually really nice and she's trying and we are a difficult class. It's kind of like honesty that we're getting in this diary entry over here. And also still some more informal language, like, honestly, why me? The head teacher accused me, me of doing blah, blah, blah. And that she'd been through the ringer. So there we've got an idiom. Of course, the head teacher never apologised to me. Man, this whole day has me thinking about teachers in a new light. They have it tough and deal with so much more than just teaching. It's like there are guides in this chaotic maze of teenage drama, trying to help us find our way. I never thought about it much before, but now I can't help but wonder how many of the teachers are out there silently battling their own struggles. Maybe we should cut them some slack and appreciate what they do. Today was a wake-up call and it's got me rethinking how I act. For sure I'm not the worst in the class, but that's not the point. Need to think this through and get some sleep. Mark. So a little bit of teenage sarcasm. <laughs> over here like oh, of course he never apologized to me oh they never do apologize do they um but also still we've really got this confessional tone now as he starts to think about wow i didn't even think about these teachers that might be having a hard time what did you know teachers are people i i just realized teachers are people <laughs> um and so he's like really thinking about mm, i should probably behave better it was a wake-up call um, and again, we've got some more informal language like for sure and man, which would really only be appropriate in this context as writing as a teenager, right? And also in terms of this sentence being incomplete, he doesn't say, I need to think this through. He says, need to think this through and get some sleep. And in this diary entry, he's definitely saying things that he wouldn't say to his friends, I think. Teachers are like our guides. Probably lots of people wouldn't admit how much teachers mean to them and how much teachers like shape their lives, but they would think it and feel it. So he's letting this out on paper in his diary where he knows only he is going to read it. And also notice in the diary entry, he's signing it off with his name, Mark, at the end. Now, if you would like to put yourself to the test, on the worksheet, you can see that there is an independent task. I hope you have had the worksheet as we've gone through this lesson. So the independent task is to write the opening paragraph for each of the six text types. So just the opening, just one paragraph. You can make up any extra details or information that you like because the story that I've given you is very small, right? So you will need to add on extra details to be able to write a paragraph. Here is the story. Haggleton, a seaside town, recently suffered from an oil spill which killed many wildlife, including fish and seagulls. The culprit was a local oil company who polluted the sea. A high school student, Aidan Smith, rallied together staff and students to clean up the beach, save the wildlife and petitioned to have the oil company shut down. So I've given you a few different tasks. Each one is different depending on the text type. So for example, for newspaper, a local newspaper reports on the issue. For a magazine, a student at Aidan's school writes about the issue for a student magazine. Speech, Aidan gives a speech to local politicians on this issue. Interview, Aidan's headmaster is interviewed about events on a local radio station. Letter, Aidan writes a letter to the oil company to explain his concerns. And diary, student at Aidan's school writes in their diary about recent events. So not Aidan, a student at the school. Think really carefully about the VORP. Feel free to have a look back through the exemplars to give you guys some inspiration. And do do this revision task. It will really help you to solidify everything that you've learned in this lesson. Don't forget that on my website, there is a quiz that you can do to check and see how much you have remembered from this video lesson. So do make sure you head on over there. The link is in the description below. If you liked this video lesson and you want more content like this, if you want PowerPoints, worksheets, quizzes, and lots of different resources to help you with your studies, head on over to taughtly.co.uk where you'll find more materials like this for teachers and students. Thank you so much for your attention today and I'll see you there.